Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited that you are choosing to invest some of your day to learn with us. My name is Becky Robinson, and we will be getting started with today's event very soon. Uh, but I want to give a chance for all of you who are coming in fast uh, to our Zoom webinar today. As you come in, we hope you'll take a moment to get acquainted with some of the functionality of today's event. And the most important one is the chat. So if you could please take a moment and find the chat and when you do that, I hope you will select everyone, use that drop down menu. We would love to hear from you. Where are you calling in from today? And if you happen to be calling in as part of your professional development, we hope you'll also take a moment to shout out the organization that you represent. We would love to hear uh, where you are and uh, what brings you to today's event. So welcome to Gary in Orange, California. Welcome in Virginia, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, California. The villages, Florida, uh, looks like Nebraska, Michigan, Tennessee, Washington. Uh, we do have a caller from Columbia. Uh, we've got someone representing the Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. I always struggle with that word, Oregon State. Uh, Oregon State Police. So welcome to you. Uh, welcome to Elaine, who's representing Faith United Church in Pennsylvania. Um, so thanks to you and hello to our callers in Brazil, South Africa, Quebec. Um, it looks like we're going to have an international audience again. We have UK, we have Hungary, um, we have Vero Beach, Florida. So um, good morning from the Ministry of Highways, Government of Saskatchewan uh, in Regina, Saskatchewan. Amazing. So thank you. And uh, we encourage you to use the chat throughout today's event. If you have any questions or comments, one of our goals is to create an inclusive community where everyone can learn together. So on the topic of inclusion, some of you may benefit from the functionality that we have for closed captioning. And that is something that you can turn on from your Zoom panel. So if you could use the, the closed captioning, we invite you to find and turn those on for your learning today. Um, so amazing, all of you who are coming in, we're so thrilled to have you learning with us today. Before we get any farther, I do want to let you know a couple of key ideas. One is that we, we are recording today's event, and we will make that recording available to you so that you can share it with your colleagues or rewatch it for your learning. Um, so that is an important factor for today's event. Uh, so uh, before we get any further, I do want to introduce you to our authors. Uh, so today's webinar event is centered around this forthcoming book from Barrett Kohler Publishers, The Secret of Culture Change, How to Build Authentic Stories That Transform Your Organization. And I'm thrilled to have all three authors of this book with me today. This book is launching on August 8th. And so we are in the period right now where you can pre-order this book from all your favorite online retailers, which we'll let you know about later in the event. But let me take a moment to introduce our authors. So on the top of my screen, I have Manuel Amorim, and he is a serial CEO whose most visible culture transformation project was celebrated in a Harvard Business School case. He led four publicly traded companies and has been a board director several times in six different countries. So he brings a wealth of expertise to this topic. We also have uh, Dr. J. Barney, J. B. Barney. Uh, he is a PhD from Yale, and he is among one of the top three most cited scholars in the field of strategic management. He has published over 125 articles and book chapters, along with seven books, which is amazing. Um, and he is a full-time professor at the Echo School of Management at the University of Utah. He's also a visiting professor at NSAID in France, and I'm not sure how to say this one. We should have probably done this before. Um, a business school at Oxford University, among others. So welcome to you, Dr. Jay Barney. We also have Carlos Julio with us today in uh, Sao Sam. How do you say it? Your town in Brazil? Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. And we do have a few callers from there as well. Um, he has nine books published with over 300,000 copies sold since 2001. So he's a visiting professor in four prestigious MBA schools in Brazil. Carlos hosts a daily business radio program, a weekly TV program, and in his past role as CEO at HSM, he started the largest executive training event around the globe the World Business Forum, which takes place every year in Radio City Music Hall in New York City. So the credentials of these authors are 
tremendous and I can't wait for you to learn from their expertise. So as we start out, you know, thinking about your various geographical locations and uh, varied backgrounds, I'm really curious to hear the story, Manuel, of how the three of you all met and what made you decide to collaborate to bring this important message to the world. Okay. So for that, and to give uh, the audience the appropriate context, I need to go back 25 years when I got promoted to general manager at Procter & Gamble. Uh, that day was a day when the, the, the company was completely reorganized around the world. Everybody got a new position, new reports, et cetera. And I was part of one of the uh, new, newly created business units, global business units. The president of that business unit was uh, Mark Ketchum, who later became the CEO of 3M. And we went on an offsite to discuss culture, what kind of culture we wanted for the baby care organization. Uh, we had a whole morning trying to define with a consultant what culture was. And of all of the things we discussed, there was one thing that I never forgot. And it was that if you want to understand and learn what the culture of a company is, you have to go to the cafeteria and listen to what the employees are talking about. I never forgot that. A few weeks later in my new role, I've learned another very important lesson. I made a mistake during a meeting. I did not treat a person uh, properly. I am very strict with uh, time management that we had, I think our second meeting and the human resource director came in late and he said, good morning to everybody. And I replied with a good afternoon, which was very rude, which is not the kind of person that I, that I am really. But a week later, everybody was talking about that good afternoon, everybody in the organization. And I've learned a lesson, people, talk about what the leader does. So if you connect the two uh, sort of experiences, and I did that connection in my mind was, gee, I need to be careful with what I do, but there is a lot of good that I can do if I do the proper things. So years later, I became the CEO of a company that needed major cultural transformation. And I, decided that I was going to teach what the new culture should be by bold, public, uh, unexpected behaviors. Um, and uh, that was very successful. It, it became, uh, and maybe we can get into some details later, but it became the Harvard Business School case that you've mentioned back in, during my introduction. Now, fast forward 15 years, I was attending church when I lived in Park City in the same congregation that Jay uh, went to church. And after Sunday school, we were sort of introducing uh, ourselves to each other. And, and I've learned he was a business school professor. He learned that I had been a CEO. We decided to have lunch together that week. So, we met, I think we were all planning to be there for about an hour, an hour and a half. That lunch ended up becoming a four hours meeting. And, and Jay was super curious about that, that experience that was reflected in the case, uh, in the Harvard Business School case. And, uh, you know, he wanted to, you know, he stated that he uh, had seen several, several managers, several leaders try to do culture change, it was very difficult. Uh, mostly, you know, unsuccessful attempts to do that. And he asked me to, you know, and, and, and then he, he asked me a question if what I had done was this thing related to stories, which I don't remember exactly what expression he used. But then I replied with an expression that I had been using before. I said, no, what you have to do is to build your own stories. And then he looked at me and said, wow, you know what, we should write a book about this. But first, we need to do some research to see if we can find uh, other leaders who have successfully done the same thing that you've described to me. And so that's how the project started in 2019. We did a lot of research, talked to a lot of leaders, confirmed the thesis, 
The book is filled with real stories created, built by CEOs and other business leaders. Later on, Carlos, who's a long uh, time friend of mine, was invited to, to come into the project because since he and I are Brazilians, we have high expectations about what the book will become in Latin America. Carlos is very well known and he is uh, starting to help us with the version in uh, Portuguese for the book in, uh, in Brazil and Spanish in Latin America. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. But uh, Becky, uh, before we start, I would like to, uh, to make a question for our audience. You know, uh, we know the importance of uh, the strategy be aligned with the company culture, but my question for you in the audience is, do you think your company's strategies and culture are aligned? Yes, yeah, so I have uh, launched a poll for all of you, and we would love to have your feedback on this question. Do you think your company's strategies and culture are aligned? And we're going to give you a few moments on that, um, and then we'll share the results with you. So the, the options are yes, somewhat, and no. And for our authors, you will not be able to see the poll because you're a panelist, but I'll be sharing the results in just a few moments. Go ahead. Yes, just give you a few more moments to answer. And if you have any comments or questions related to the poll, we would love to see those in the chat as well. I do still have some people answering. I'm very curious about what's going to come out of <laughs> these answers. <laughs> yes, well, I see a comment from uh, an attendee that this doesn't apply because it must be an entrepreneur building their own business. Uh, Dan says questions are more important than answers. And uh, Scott is saying hello from very hot Phoenix. So let's very take a look. Hot. Let's take a look at these results. It looks like 57% um, of people, that's the highest response rate, are saying that their company strategies and culture are only somewhat aligned. 25% are saying, no, my company's strategies and culture are not aligned. And only 18% of people are saying that their company's culture and strategies are aligned. So that is a, a pretty insightful uh, set of results. So thank you to those who have shared. Well, so as we dive into today's topic, I'm curious to hear from our authors, why is culture change so difficult? Well, I think, I think there, the general consensus is that um, most culture change efforts fail. Uh, and and um, there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, you know, culture is an intangible asset characteristic of organizations. It's widely diffused. It's in our minds. It's not like changing a machine or changing a supply chain kind of relationship. Culture change also speaks to trying to change the core values and beliefs and actions of employees, some of whom are quite comfortable with the uh, with the, the, the situation that they're currently in. And so um, it, 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 culture change, experts on organizational change, many of them, still very well, well known, they're actually cited in the book, have concluded that culture change is in fact not possible. The thing to do is to figure out what your culture is and then choose a strategy that leverages that, leverages that culture because culture change is so difficult. I will admit to myself, over the years when I was working as a consultant with a variety of companies, um, if they asked me, if the client asked, which, which, would, which is used to do, change our strategy or change our culture, I would say change your strategy. And, and that's problematic in some ways, I know that, but we didn't, have a, we didn't have a tool for changing culture. And so it's been very, very difficult. I know, I know for sure, by the way, I think our research has shown, uh, here's some things that uh, successful culture change efforts never do, never. We have no data. The first thing they do is they don't announce that they're gonna do a culture change. It's not like some big meeting, okay, here's our big culture change. Reason for that, by the way, is those announcements, that's all cheap talk. And everyone knows the next crisis, financial crisis comes, 
all the stuff that's like culture is easy to sort of back out of. So there's no announcement of a culture change. Uh, another thing that never works is coming up, a, doing a very detailed systematic analysis of the current culture. All, all that really does, by the way, it tends to reinforce the old culture and not build the new culture. Another thing that almost never happens is a CEO going off and generating a long list of values and then announcing those values. That never works. So, uh, so we have lots of examples of, of uh, culture change failures. Um, we were, what was so exciting for me when I was talking to Manuel that, that long afternoon was the possibility uh, that there would, there would be people out there who actually had, had been successful at changing their culture. And we wanted to learn about that. Emmanuel, uh, during the writing of the book, uh, you know, he, we have to be very precise in terms of the difference between a storytelling and a story building. Could you tell us a little sure. bit about these differences? Sure. But before I do that, let, just let me add something uh, to what Jay has just uh, shared with us all. Culture change is possible. It has been done. Not easy. It's a big challenge. I've done it, and I have very concrete uh, data to demonstrate the drastic, fast culture change in a, in a multi-billion dollars company that I've managed for the first time as a CEO in the telecommunications industry in just five years, which is the case reflected in the, in the Harvard case. And when we were interviewing CEOs and other leaders for the book, we found many similar experiences using the same tools so and using the principles that i've described initially in my uh, presentation today what the leader does if it's done properly in a public way not as a show off but as an authentic action to break with the past you know and, and points to a new future with good reasoning and, and he brings with him or herself uh, the rest of the leadership of the company to do the same. Uh, this has power. This has uh, changing power. Now, the difference between storytelling and story building, uh, which is very well described in the book, is storytelling. And you can pick anything. You can pick a real story. And a lot of leaders do that to inspire, to motivate, to exemplify employees and the rest of the organization. It could be a real story, it could be fictional, uh, but that's not their story. It's not their behavior. It's not their commitment. It's not their heart, their mind there who has the power to make people stop, think, and then be motivated to, to change. I'll give you just one example, which is one of the many uh, stories I built within uh, that telecommunications company. It was very hierarchical, very command, command and control, so hierarchical to the point that uh, my predecessor would not allow anybody to get into the elevator when he was in. Uh, so don't don't don't, don't want to interact with the hoi polloi in that organization. It's amazing. Yeah. So you know the the key executives have had their own call center to be well served. So one day to demonstrate what we really needed to do to become a customer oriented company, I you know quit that department. Uh, it, it was dismantled. I said now if you want to get help. If you have a telecommunicate, you know, an internet problem in your house, you call the call center where our customers, we had 15 million customers where they called to get help. And then one day, you know, it became my, my turn. I had to stay for over two hours in the call center uh, to get help. And I couldn't, my problem wasn't solved, but the kid, a 19 year old college student on the other end of the line was doing everything possible to help me out. So I've learned a lot from that call and ended up inviting that kid and three of his peer, peers to make a presentation to my vice presidents on what we needed to do 
to enable them to help our customers better. So a week later, those four kids were there teaching, literally teaching our VPs what they needed to do. This was a, I mean, this was a revolution inside the company, a hierarchical company where top managers are not told what to do. They are the ones who tell what people need to do. We're being told by these guys without a college degree yet what to do. And I went one step further. I looked at them and said, how many of these 14 problems that were presented today were you aware of? Less than half. And I said, okay, the sales of this product are suspended for now until you fix at least 10 of the 14 problems. You come up with a plan next week. And I'm not going to be the one evaluating and approving your plan. These four kids are going to. So now you had the kids in command because they had the knowledge and that's the type of hierarchy we wanted. And, you know, making a long story short, this, this story traveled super fast. I asked my corporate communications guys to write the story of the kid, not my story, but his story and what he had done, what his contributions had been. Everybody was talking about this. And two or three weeks later, this story was the cover of the most important business magazine in the country. So this is what story building, story making is and how different it is from just telling a story that somebody else came up with. And those are the stories that have the power to change cultures. The joy in writing this book, I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of work associated with it too and analyzing and figuring everything out. But the joy in writing this book is identifying over 50 of these kinds of stories and then understanding what makes these stories more or less effective. It was, was just a, it's a great intellectual challenge, but also it's deeply uh, satisfying as, 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 uh, as uh, people figure out what kind of culture they need to really implement their strategy and then, and then make it happen through sometimes it's, it's, I, I told this Emmanuel as we started going through these, these, these are just, these actions are heroic uh, because they, they are so inconsistent with the received culture and yet so vital to be able to uh, implement the new, the new strategy that's required. If you don't implement the new strategy, I mean, in some cases, there's not going to be a firm. It's going to be significantly uh, adversely affected without the new strategy. And so uh, I, I really, really was excited to have to be part of engaging in those conversations to understand what they're doing. Yeah, that's really uh, clear. Um, and I'm curious to hear. So in the book, you highlight six key attributes of a successful culture change story. Right. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the six key attributes. And then also, do you need all of them? So Manuel has just told about a powerful story that he built. Right. Do we need all of those in order to create a culture changing story? Um, our data suggests that you need at least five of the six, but all six are handy. So let me go through them really quickly. The first one, and, and Manuel's story exemplifies all of them very, very well. The first one is that um, uh, the story has to be authentic, that it's authentic for the person who's creating the story. Um, the, 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 lot, the language we use is that your employees can smell hypocrisy miles away. And if you're saying we want to have, a, in Manuel's case, a non-hierarchical, customer-oriented strategy and culture, and yet he is not himself customer oriented. He is not himself transparent. Then people won't believe it. Why should they? I mean, it just doesn't. So, and, and so, uh, it's interesting. This this organizational change starts with an understanding of the values, the things that are important to the the, the leader who is going to be leading the change. The second sounds strange to many people, but the second one is. You got to star in your own story, and that sounds kind of like a very egoistic, a very you know self -serving. It's just the opposite. It is. This is where the courage often is manifest, um, because by starting in your own story, um, 
people will take it seriously. One of the questions we address in the paper in the book is, um, is, uh, is culture change a top-down process or a bottom-up process? And, and later on, uh, it, we, we, we hope we'll talk about this, there's a lot of bottom-up stuff that happens. But in the beginning, uh, if, if the leader is not credibly committed to culture change, it's not gonna happen. It's, it's just too risky for people to try to do that on their own. So, so for that to happen, the, the, the leader has to scar in the story. Then, if, then the third attribute is it has to, the story has to break with the past and provide a past to the future. So it has to be, see, this is really different than the old culture, really different. And, and Manuel's story, it, it's just, I wish I could have been there <laughs> to see the uh, senior VPs of the company being lectured to by these 19 year olds from the call center. Um, not, not just to see the substance, but see the cultural revolution that was created by that. And like I said, we have over 50 stories that are in that variety, that same kind of, of uh, event, just amazing thing. So, so it has to break with the past, but and try to pass the future. And here's the tricky part. It's the past of the future is a direction. It's not, and here are the list of four, four values that we're gonna have. It's always four, I don't know why it's always four, but oh, here are the four values we're gonna have in the future. It, no, ultimately, the, that it's story that breaks with the past is going to create an opportunity to co-create the new culture between the, the leaders and, and the employees. And so it's a path to a new culture, but not a clear step. Next one, next one is that it has to, this story, and Manuel is another great example of this, it has to appeal to the head and to the heart. It's, 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 on the head side, it's like, it, if there's not a business case for culture change, then culture change is an ego trip. I want, uh, there's, not a, there's not any strategic reason for doing this culture change. The reason I want to do it is because I want this organization to reflect my personal values. Give me a break. I mean, that's, that's kind of scary at some level in terms of, of ego impact. Um, on the other hand, if culture change is essential for a firm to be able to implement its, its, its strategies, now that's a business case. Part of the story here is this is going to lay on us to be having kind of financial performance. But, but culture isn't just a business case. It also has to appeal to the heart. It has to, it has to tug at our values and our emotions and our sense of purpose. And it has to engage us in a higher level. And some of the stories that we that we have in the book are just, I mean, I have read them now hundreds of times probably, and I'm still moved, emotionally moved by the by the by the action that are taken. The, 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 the one that is not necessarily a requirement, what we saw it a lot, um, is that the stories are very theatrical. I mean, think about this. Bring the kids in in front of all the senior executives is very theatrical, and and some of some of those stories are are just hilarious. How theatrical the CEOs are! It 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 it, it makes the stories easier to remember, and it also is a, a is a way of of sticking a stake in the ground. Yeah, I I'm, I'm going to engage in this behavior that is very may, may appear to be very strange for for CEOs, but but it, it, it makes it very memorable and says, I am serious about this. I'm doing crazy things to make sure this happens. And the last is uh, they, uh, the, the process has to uh, it, it empower others in the organization to build their own stories. And some of those are also just incredible as, we have one story where the CEO makes these, these, these changes in, in the culture and he, he doesn't know if it's taken or not. And then this, Young guy does this incredible uh, level of service commitment to uh, one of their customers. It, it, it doesn't get permission because it's he's already he's, I've already had permission. We already changed the culture and 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 it's just it's just it's just a heartwarming, exhilarating thing to see happen with that. So those are the six attributes. And of, of the six, um, 
the ethicality is well, it, the ethicality is a matter of degree. I mean, we have some people dressing up like uh, rock stars, uh, you know, with uh, <laughs> ripped shirts, and I mean, and we have a wide range of theatricality. So there's almost always some level of theory uh, theatricality, but that varies to some extent. But the other six, if, if I'll, I'll start with authenticity, if it, if you're it's one of the questions we deal with in that chapter is suppose you need to change the culture, but the cultural values you need are not consistent with who you are as a leader. You need to recuse yourself from the culture change. You need to find, you need to promote yourself into a position where that's no longer relevant or you, you, you cannot, or change your values. I mean, there's lots of things you can do there, but you cannot start culture change with hypocrisy and, and yeah, it goes you like cannot that. fake it you, you cannot can't fake it. it exactly right because uh, the people yeah. the people see it they 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 they, they see you on a day-to-day -day basis and you just can't get away with it yeah manuel what else would you add in the role of the leader in the culture change process and uh, why so much of the story building relies in him or her well, first, as I said before, uh, the leader of an organization, it could be, you know, a district, a subdivision or the company. Uh, and you, you know, if you're employed, you all know this, everybody talks about what the leader does. So that can be a problem if you're not doing the right things, but that has a lot of power too. So I would say that my answer to this question is divided in two fronts. One, you have to be the one starting. You have to lead the pack. You have to show that you're willing, that you're committed. You have to demonstrate how it, it, it is done. Let me give you another example within Telefonica, that same company that, that I was talking about. There is a, a figure, uh, a, a corporate position in Europe and Latin America that is not present here in the United States, which is called the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman is the last resort in the uh, customer attention uh, process of a company. If nothing gets resolved, you should call the Ombudsman. And there are some filters to make sure that not everybody's calling the, the guy. Uh, in my organization, when I took over, he did not report to the CEO. So the CEO was not aware what were the critical issues that never got resolved. When I got there, I, I changed that. They said, no, you're going to report to me. And every week I want on my desk three of the worst cases that you had faced. So one day I saw one where, where we had, I mean, disrespected uh, uh, we've done, we had done everything with that customer. He was very upset. I got upset when I read the letter. So I decided to call the guy. I said, no, now this case is mine. I am going to solve the problem. So I called the guy and I introduced myself and he answered. I said, look, I am Manuel Amorim. I'm the CEO of the company. His immediate response was, yeah, and I am Bill Clinton. <laughs> He didn't believe me. I had, it took some convincing. And I, you know, I, I ended up solving the guy's problem. He became the biggest fan of the company, the biggest fan and promoter of the company. He helped us develop a new product just because we listened. And, uh, and then I, I felt at one point in time that it was time to invite all of the employees to do things that were sim uh, similar, to create their own stories, to reflect the uh, direction, the culture that we wanted uh, to establish there. And we had a competition, in fact, in two waves of projects that we needed to implement to increase customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction. In the service industry, you cannot have satisfied customers if your employees are not satisfied. Uh, the results were amazing. 70% of our organization came up with and implemented new ideas to increase our customer satisfaction. The results we became for the first time and the only telecommunications company in the country to be among the top 
100 uh, be best companies to work for, the top 100 uh, best companies for women to work for, and our customer satisfaction ratings went through the roof. But we had, of 20,000 uh, employees, 14,000 creating stories, building stories that were talked about. Then, you know, you have, and that's the second, I would say, role that the leader has to have. You, you, you set the example, you set the standard, you surprise people, you show what can be done, you slash the, the hierarchy, and then you invite everybody and they will come. I mean, they, they, they will follow and they will get excited and they will understand and they will do if you give them permission. So you have to invite and give permission. So one, one thing that's important um, uh, to recognize is that um, um, this book is not about what is the ideal culture all firms should have. Uh, we make no uh, effort to do that because our, our logic is the, the right culture to have depends on the strategy you're pursuing. So if you need to pursue a consumer-oriented, customer-oriented culture, then a, a strategy, then you better have a culture that values customers and feedback and those kinds of things. Um, uh, we have uh, examples in the book, stories of, of uh, culture change um, with a wide variety of cultures. We, we have... Uh, Companies going from a highly decentralized to a much more centralized model because that's what the strategy needed. And we needed a bunch of cultural values that, that facilitated that. We have um, uh, technology innovation uh, and, and getting that under control. So, I mean, we have a wide variety of different strategies. So, our goal is not to say, here is here are the seven attributes that every firm should have or every culture should have. So those are going to be deeply contingent on the strategy that you're pursuing. Um, and uh, that's another one of the things uh, uh, we have, our, the, the, the CEOs and other business leaders we, uh, we interview are from 60 different companies across 20 different countries in 15 different industries. I mean, we're, we're, we really wanna make clear that this is not, uh, we're not trying to figure out what the right culture is. We're trying to figure out the link between strategy and culture and then how to change culture. So I'm curious to hear, uh, Jay, what about employees? So Manuel spoke to the important way that a leader needs to really start the move toward culture change. Um, but what role do employees have in building successful culture change stories? Well, I mean, the, the answer to that is that uh, one way you know culture change is actually happening is when employees start building their own stories. Um, the, the, we, one, one great, we call this a story cascade. So that the CEO or the business leader starts by building a, a story that, that sort of lays the groundwork and then empowers other people in the organization to start building their own stories. And, and those people could be, they could be individual contributors, they could be managers of their own offices, Whatever, but as they begin to uh, build their own stories, then then, then, we, then we see good things. Let me give you an example. I, I, I mentioned briefly. Let me in more detail. This is a company in the states, the United States. It's in the uh, it's in the uh, business of, uh, of uh, they they manufacture and sell grills, Traeger grills. Everybody knows you guys know what this company is. Well, Traeger grills. Um, when uh, the current CEO. Um, Originally invested in the company, he discovered that it was a had a very toxic culture. He actually engaged in a very radical move. He closed up the headquarters, changed the location, hired new employees, and basically tried to build a, a new culture from scratch. And one of the values that he had in his new culture was uh, he he was we we have to be customer oriented. This is a high end product. We want it to always work. We want it to, it's, it's a disruptive technology within in a very mature industry. I don't know. So customer satisfaction has got to be really high on the list. But that's pretty abstract. So um, it, after the weekend, he comes in on Monday and his VP of sales comes in and says, you won't believe I'll make up the man. You won't believe what George did over the weekend. What did George do over the weekend? Well, 
uh, Thursday or Friday, he, George gets this call from a, a guy who, uh, a customer, who's also a uh, manager at a Costco, which is a big discount retail operation in the States, uh, and a, a very important customer for, for uh, Traeger, uh, uh, saying that his, his drill wasn't working. And so on the phone, George diagnoses the problem. Says, oh, look, look, I got it. Um, goes to the office, gets the right part, flies from headquarters to Seattle with the part, goes to the guy's home, fixes the machine, his machine, and then uh, helps him uh, prepare his, uh, his, uh, his meal because they're going to have a big party the next day. So shows him how to do the right rub for the smoking. I, I don't know about that stuff. Flies back to headquarters and then goes to work on Monday like nothing's happened. Like it's, that's just, that's what you expect. That's, well, of course, this is phenomenal. So what happens is that the, the customer who was this manager at Costco calls his boss, who is the division, who is, runs the, the Costco. The Costco uh, manager calls uh, corporate Costco corporate, the merchandising people and says, do you know what this guy did for us? And the, the Costco merchandising person then calls the VP of sales at, uh, at Traeger and and then uh, and then that's how the CEO finds out about it. And of course, now now once this happens, and, and you know this guy's just working at his computer, like what's the big deal? Well, you you have just demonstrated the role of employees in helping to build the culture change uh, that goes on. And I, if I if I may add something, Jay, because I'm seeing sure. some of the comments here in, in the chat. Uh, one of the things the need the leader needs to be prepared to do because it, invariably every time that you engage in a culture changing process or project, you're gonna find people who are who understand it, understand why yeah, yeah, they yeah. engage, they want to do it, but there will be opposition to it. Absolutely, there will be people who don't want to do that, and they will even fight that. So. You have two alternatives. The first one, the person is important enough in the organization. You're trying to change the person. You go and you talk and you try to convince and you invite, etc. If doesn't, if that doesn't work, then you change the person. You fire the person and bring someone else with the same values, with the same things that you want to do. So you either change the person or you change the person. But there has to be a firm decision with the change, a firm commitment with the change. This guy at Traeger, he did not only change the headquarters, he fired 100% of the organization. No, he, he, he left some uh, incentive in, incentives in place for a transition, but he decided that that culture was so intoxicating and people were so entrenched and... and, and uh, angry you know against any kind of change and he said well i need new people so he hired 100 percent of the positions in the new headquarters and the company today is quite different than it was before that's the kind of also commitment to change that the leader needs to have so by the way the act of firing someone especially someone who's maybe been your friend someone who's been successful in the old culture um is, is a story. Is a story. It's building a story that that is has. And by the way, I'm we're fully aware that that can be a very difficult, painful process for the business leader to make that decision. Um, but uh, it's not uncommon in the stories that we studied for for people who have been successful in the old culture to have to, to separate from the company because they cannot change. So uh, we want to pause for just a moment. Uh, we're so grateful for all the questions that you all have been putting in the chat. And we know that you may be excited to get a copy of the book. So just a, a brief uh, moment to let you know that The Secret of Culture Change is available for pre-order now on all major retailers. The book will be released with an ebook, an audiobook, and the paperback copy. So we would encourage you, if you're getting value from this hour, to pre-order a book for yourself, for someone on your team team, a friend, or a colleague, um, and we are putting the links to the book in the chat for you. You can also learn more about 
uh, the authors in the book at culturechangesecret.com. And I would encourage you as well. I've noticed in the chat that several of you are talking about connecting with one another on social media. I know that Manuel and Jay and Carlos would be open to connecting with you on LinkedIn as well, as would I. Uh, so if you would want to find any of us on LinkedIn and make a connection, we would love to stay um, involved. We are going to take some time right now to address some of the questions that have come in the chat. And uh, Kira, who's been my chat host on today's event, has not only been pulling some key ideas out and putting them in the chat, but she also has been putting your questions uh, in an easy spot for me. And I have seen that Matthew asked this question twice, so I want to make sure we get to it. Um, he is curious about what the reason or trigger was for the cultural change in the telecom company, Manuel, that you were leading. Okay. If you could share the trigger Great for question. that culture Great change. Question. This is one example where the choice between choosing the strategy or choosing the culture when they were disaligned left no room for changing the strategy. So the culture had to change to adapt to a new strategy. Uh, when, when most countries privatize their, their uh, telecommunications industry, because in many countries, like was the case in Brazil, they are state controlled uh, enterprises. Uh, they give, initially a monopoly period for the new incumbents to come in and do all of the investments that the state was not uh, capable of. So we, we had been a monopoly, a state-owned monopoly, and we became a private monopoly for a period of about three years. We were investing about six to seven billion dollars every year just to expand the network. So the government uh, government gave us a break. Say, okay, during the next three years, you guys have a monopoly. You invest what you have to invest. Here are the goals you need to meet. For instance, we had 7 million clients in a wait list. It took about two or three years for anybody to get a line, a basic voice line. And uh, the goal was in three years, they couldn't wait more than 48 hours to get a new line. So there was a lot of work to do, a lot of investment to do. However, after that first initial period of three years, the regulations were going to change and new competition was going to be allowed in our market. Uh, and for people who are not familiar with Brazil, the state of Sao Paulo, which is one of the 27 states in Brazil, if it was a country, it would be one of the top 25 economies in the world, something like this, around that. And the city of Sao Paulo has half the GDP of the state. So you have in a very concentrating, concentrated area, a lot of revenue being generated in telecommunications. So, we guessed, and we guessed it right, that once the market were, was open, everybody was going to want to come into Sao Paulo. And the regulations were such that the incumbents had to offer, like, like here in the States, it's the same case. You cannot own the monopoly of a network. You have to rent it out if another player comes in. Uh, so we needed to move from an organization that was not used to compete, that was not used to sell and convince people to buy their product instead of competition, into a company, a company that was a lot more customer-oriented, innovative, uh, where the front line had more power to react to customers' complaints and requests, and uh, and, and be a, a company that had selling and marketing and product development in its DNA. None of that was present. That's why we had to make such a drastic change in the culture because the strategy, the new strategy was inevitable, was a no brainer. Yeah, it's, it's like, a, here's, the, here's the thing, it's ironic in most, many of the examples, the, the um, the, the uh, change in regulatory context is a particularly discreet example. That doesn't happen in all, all those situations. But at some point, the business leader recognizes, you know, the way that we approach our customers, the way that we compete against our competitors 
the way we are positioned in our marketplace isn't working. It's just not working. And so we're going to have to change our strategy. And then, and then the very next question says, but you know, guess what? The culture that we have in place in the organization aligns with our own strategy. But we need a new strategy to go forward. We have to change the culture. So it's very or sometimes it's a technology change. That, that, that would be another example. So you actually had the technology stuff going on too, because you're going from a wired to a non-wired mobile system, internet-based. So um, it, it, that's another thing. So we, and, and you can have political changes. You can have a lot of exogenous shocks or just the drift of strategy can change. Right. But this goes back to this, this um, head and heart thing. Uh, Closest change is hard. It's very demanding on the leader as well as the employees. Uh, there's got to be a really good business case for it. If there isn't, then, then we're, we, would be, we would be skeptical about whether or not that change would actually occur. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to sort through the questions. I do want to own that we're not going to possibly get to them all, but we will share the questions with our authors and hopefully coming soon to LinkedIn or some other platform, uh, we'll be able to get some responses to you for any of the questions that have come sounds in. Like, sounds like homework, man. It sounds like uh, some blog posts or videos that you all can create or maybe a, a second event. Uh, so Janet is asking, how do you deal with the traditionalists who fear change and hold back, uh, hold the effort back when there's a culture change initiative happening? Let me comment in Manuel. And, and so uh, you said you have to start by understanding what's going on here. I mean, is it is it that they don't these people are don't understand the need for change? That's an information asymmetry problem. I have to explain to you why there's a challenge to our strategy. Do they not understand that? So there's an educational possibility. Maybe that uh, they have personal values that are inconsistent with the values they're going to have. And that's, a, that's a bigger challenge. We're not, what we found is that um, um, Rarely, sometimes, but rarely does culture change require broad swaths of firing people. But it, it is the case we, we that we, culture change sometimes does require that, uh, that that we change out some employees, and we've seen that enough to sort of say that is that's a it's a critical critical thing. Yeah, to do. yeah, critical. Uh, now, one thing that I don't want to miscommunicate here in the thesis is that. Number one, the, when you embark into this journey, there is no way back and you need to make it clear. We are gonna go into this direction and there's no way back. And I am committed to do this. And so the leader needs to be willing to be repeating those types of behaviors and creating those stories that right. shows that commitment, that direction, that consistency. Second, there is a lot. So it's not creating one or two or three stories that, are, that is going to make the change or, or ignite. I think this is the best uh, term that is going to ignite the change. You know, I, can, I, I could share, uh, you know, a hundred examples of things that I have done during those five years. The second thing is there, it takes a lot of talking, a lot of education. You know, one of the things that I did when I joined the telecommunications company it's called Telefonica. From now on, I'm going to refer to it as Telefonica. I visited every single employee group in the company, every single one, something that uh, previous CEOs had never done. Many times when I arrived, I felt like I was in the Santa, I was the Santa Claus in a Christmas party because they brought cameras to take pictures because it was the first time in, in their 30 years history of the company that the CEO was showing up. You have to talk, you have to answer questions, you have to open up and you have to explain, you have to get their hearts to minds and hearts, as they said. And the third one, you cannot let enemies of the change, internal enemies, especially up in the hierarchy, to be in that position for too long. So as I said, you either change the man or woman, or you change the person, one or the other. 
I, I, example in the book, uh, it's not one of our formal stories, but I had a, a, a good friend who was involved in a major culture change effort at a large retailer. We'll just keep it exact since we don't have permission in this case to mention the company. But, um, and, and ultimately, uh, the, the culture change did not work. I think that would be the general consensus the firm has, has suffered financially for, for a long time. Um, and I asked them, I said, what would you have done differently in terms of implementing this culture change? He said, I know exactly what I would have done differently. That first day that I was in the office and I had that meeting with my direct reports, I had, I had 10, I'm picking this number up, but roughly correct, 10 direct reports. And there were four people that were clearly not going to support the change that we needed to do, no matter what. He says, so my big mistake was I didn't fire them that day. I waited a year. And that year cost us millions of dollars as they undermined and, and built confusion, brought confusion into people's minds about how committed we were as an organization. And a year later, he had to fire all four of them. He said, I should have done that day. Um, so uh, and, and I, I know uh, in the uh, change management, academic change management literature, this kind of uh, uh, you know, fire people in to facilitate change is probably not popular, but that is business reality. That is business reality. We got a strategy we got to do. We got to change the culture to make it happen. And these people are not getting on board. Then, you know, Jim Collins' concept of uh, this is an on the bus issue here. And uh, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. And, and that's it. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up this amazing hour of learning together, I do want to remind you that you can pre-order the book, The Secret of Culture Change, on all major retailers, and we'll get those links back in the chat for you. You can learn more about the authors and their work at culturechangesecret.com. And I've asked Kira to to uh, share uh, Manuel and Jay and Carlos's LinkedIn uh, links into the chat as well. So you may connect with them there. And as we wrap up the hour, I believe our authors have uh, some stories that they want to send you out with. Manuel? Well, I, you know, I, I think we've, we've uh, shared everything we, we had prepared to share. Uh, with the audience today thank you very much for your participation for your interest we are honored that you were able to stay here with us for about an hour uh, i i can tell you you know we had we have about 15 endorsements of very important people for the book but one that i really liked was one that was shared by the ceo of uh, uh, the American Red Cross and a, a former uh, business school professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, Gail McGovern. Uh, she said that the, you know, the, the, this was an effective and engaging manual for anyone leading through change, but that it isn't a book, just a, a guide, but also an entertainment, entertaining read. And uh, I think Jay expressed uh, his feelings about this. I have personally seen Jay making a presentation to a group of business school professors. And he had to stop when telling one of the stories because the emotion took over, despite the fact that he had already written about the story. It wasn't new for him. Uh, so we are very pleased with the result. We are very proud of the result. And, uh, you know, we are not in this to make money. I don't know if you guys know that authors don't make money by writing books. But at this stage in our lives, it's really the, the issue of leaving a useful legacy for future managers and leaders. That's what is the main goal here. And we've invited a lot, a lot of other leaders to share their experiences that you can find in the book. Yeah, I, thanks, man. Well, I wanted to just also just follow up. Uh, we, were, we, were, we ended up talking a little bit about firing people, and that's not a major message of the book, although it's clearly there. The major message of the book is culture change is engaging, inspiring. It is creative. It is leadership at its highest, most refined level, and also at its most 
detailed, nitty gritty, working with individuals one at a time to help culture uh, uh, change. Uh, uh, I, I, I call, um, uh, our book is dedicated to the business leaders we interviewed, which is, uh, and just to let you know, almost all, all but a handful of stories, we actually, we have the name of the business leader and the company where they did the culture change. So these people were very open, and it's very, it's a, it's an amazing thing that they're willing to do, and and uh, and for all those reasons, um, you you, re you finish reading the book and you're thinking two things, you know. The first is these these people are heroes. They are doing, they are saving businesses, they're saving jobs, they're transforming their organizations, they're creating huge social value. And the second is, you know what? We can do this. It can be done. You can learn how to do this. And, and that's just been a great opportunity for me to be involved in this process. Okay, my wrap up is, uh, you know, what a class, you know, so it's, a, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here with my partners, Manuel and Jay. And of course, uh, my participation was much more as an attendee because of course you don't have to support my English to discuss it, such a uh, important issues, but I thank you all for being here. You have my my social media contact here in the chat, so I'll be available for you. And of course, when we launch the book in Latin America and Brazil, you know, so maybe I'm gonna help Jay with the Portuguese and Spanish. Okay, my Portuguese is not great, I have to admit. <laughs> thank you so much to all of you for investing this hour with us.